بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صباح الخير أنا دكتور منير خماس فرج سشار الجراحة العصبية ونائب رئيس المجلس العربي للجراحة العصبية بالوطن العربي ورئيس المجلس بالعراق We will talk about the spine surgery حقيقة موضوع جدا واسع The trauma section will be covered by the orthopedic surgeons and the spinal tumors will be covered by the general oncology lectures. Here we will concentrate on the commonest problems affecting the spine and that is the degenerative changes. In this lecture we will cover the cervical spondylosis and in the next lecture we will cover the lumbar degenerative changes. Now, what do we mean by spondylosis? By definition, it is a degenerative alterations of the cervical spine. Degenerative معناها الانحطاطي. Actually, it's an aging process. It is a wear and tear degeneration. Wear and tear تعني الشيء الذي يبلى بسبب كثرة الاستخدام. So it's a normal aging process and any person after the age of 40, if you take an MRI or X-ray, you will find some element of degeneration. But they may appear in a younger age group. This is usually accelerated either because of a trauma or a disease like rheumatoid arthritis affecting the cervical spine. So what are these degenerative changes. Actually, it's a mixed group of pathologies. They may involve the intervertebral disc, vertebra, and its associated joints. The main pathology is loss of water content of the soft tissues. So, after the loss of water content in the disc, the disc height will be decreased, and it may bulge either anteriorly or posteriorly. Because of that, there will be a micro instability between every adjacent vertebrae. <clears throat> and this will lead to what we call reactive hyperostosis. So there will be a formation of an osteophytes at the vertebral end the plates. And these osteophytes may <coughs> press on adjacent either nerve root or spinal cord itself. If the osteophytes affecting the uncovertebral joints, and these are specifically only seen in the cervical spine or in the fascia joint, this will reduce or cause limitation of mobility of that segment. When several vertebrae affected, there will be a segmental instability, and this will lead to hypertrophy of the ligantum flavum and this will result in spinal canal stenosis and spinal intervertebral foramen narrowing. The end stage will be cervical kyphosis. If we see here, this is a narrowing of the disc space with bulge of the disc posteriorly and formation of an osteophyte causing pressure over the spinal cord. The ligamentum flavum connecting the laminae posteriorly here is also hypertrophied as it is seen in the axial view. The uncovertebral joint may get hypertrophied resulting in severe intervertebral spine, intervertebral foramen narrowing. Actually, neck pain is very prevalent. It's a count between 17 up to 34 percent in general population, and usually it appears in the fourth or fifth decades of life. There is a variable clinical features, symptoms, and signs regarding the spinal degenerative changes, but from pathophysiological point of view, we can divide it into three major group of clinical features. We have the spondylotic syndrome. Spondylotic syndrome means the changes that result because of the spondylosis itself. Usually the pain will arise from the motion of the degenerated segment and accentuated by movement and during specific positions like sitting for a lot a long time on the computer, reading or driving. Usually there will be 
the pain is more severe at the night and the pain often associated with uh, radiation to the shoulder girdle but this is not dermatomal or neuronal distribution the patient may have vague numbness thermal sensation tingling vertigo is common but why it's appeared we don't know and the headache is a very common commitment usually it will be an occipital headache if the spondylotic part affecting the adjacent nerve root that's to say there will be narrowing of the intervertebral foramen then we will have what we call a radicular pain and this pain will follow the dermatomal distribution either sensory changes motor weakness or reflex anomalies depending on the affected nerve root but later on when there will be a compression over the spinal cord itself which is usually a very slow process, it takes a long duration to affect the spinal cord, it will lead to symptoms. And the first red flag will be the numbness and the clumsiness. Clumsiness means the patient will lose the ability of doing fine motor skills, for example, writing or playing with a guitar or a piano with the painful hand. And later on, the lung tract will be affected, resulting in abnormal gait and sphincteric disorders. For the signs in the spondylotic syndrome, there will be, because the pain is aggravated by movement, there will be stiff neck with limitation of the movement. And the neck pain actually will be accentuated by extension and rotation. This is because the extension will result in further narrowing of the spinal canal and intervertebral foramen and compress more over the neuronal elements. The pain may be referred to the occiput, to the head or to the shoulder, and usually by palpation there will be chronic trapezial myalgia. A radiculopathy, so there will be sensory deficit, motor deficit, and reflex deficit, usually in a form of hyporeflexia. And there is a test, we call it Sperling test. This is by extension and rotation with axial compression over the head, the pain will be radiated to the affected side. But usually uh, this test is very painful and usually we do not do it, but you have to know it. When there will be myelopathy, there will be atrophy of interosseous muscle with muscle weakness. There will be hyperreflexia, clonus, and with Babinski sign, there may be sensory vibratory deficit and the gait will be spastic gait, usually broad base and jerky. During the investigations here, we can have a lot of information we can get from the plain X-ray actually. And the plain X-ray of the cervical spine, we should look first for the lateral X-ray, looking for what we call the sagittal profile. Is it in lordosis? Is it straightened or it is in kyphosis? If there will be loss of lordosis or even kyphosis, it is significant. The sagittal spinal diameter, if it is less than 10 millimeter, there is a high risk of developing cervical myelopathy. This measurement usually cannot be done on plain X-ray, but with a special software to measure exactly the diameter of the spinal canal. We should look for the spinal alignment. If there is any spondylolysis or retrolysis or if there is any osteophytes, the disc space narrowing, and uh, if there is any vertebral collapse, facet joint osteoarthritis, and in the lateral view, we can look for the size of the intervertebral foramen. In these examples, for this one, there is loss of lumbar uh, cervical lordosis, there is straightening of the cervical spine, indicating there is severe muscle spasm. There is significant narrowing of the intervertebral foramen, but I repeat, this cannot be measured by only the plain X-ray, only in very severe cases. Usually you need special software 
to measure exactly this diameter of the spinal canal. There is an osteophyte formation. There is loss of height of the disc space here. In the other example, we have cervical kyphosis and the spinal canal diameter looks normal, but there is cervical kyphosis resulting from this narrow disc space. Usually, whenever you go down, the disc space should be more than the above vertebrae. Here, it is less than the above vertebrae, so there is disc space narrowing. In this example, we have spondylolysis of C3 over C4 and C5 over C6 with severe facet joint spondylosis. And in this lateral foramen, also the intervertebral foramen must be larger than the above. This oblique view showed that this intervertebral foramen is less than the above, so there is significant intervertebral foramen narrowing here. MRI usually will show detailed disc space and the neuronal element changes, and the CT will be show more bony details and pathologies. In this example, we have cervical spine of MRI of the cervical spine. In this one, we have what we call T1 image, where the CSF is a black, the fat is white, the CSF is hypo-intense, the fat is hyper-intense. In T2 image, the CSF is hyper-intense and the fat remain hyper-intense. We can see this is the spinal cord. This is the uh, watery element of the disc space, there is a bulge over the disc posteriorly, and you see these white spots in the spinal cord. These are actually an ischemic changes affecting the spinal cord because of the bulging of the discs. In the axial view, we can see more the disc protrusion and there is severe narrowing in the intervertebral foramen on this side as compared with this one. If we inject the patient with contrast dye through lumbar puncture and take a CT, this is called CT myelography. It will show, for example, in this case, a lot of pathologies can be elicited. There is a spondylolysis of C3 over C2, C3 over C4, with significant compression of the spinal cord, with significant narrowing of the intervertebral foramen between C3 and C4, hypertrophied oncovertebral joint with significant narrowing of the intervertebral foramen as compared to the side. EMG also would be helpful to differentiate radiculopathies from peripheral neuropathies like entrapment neuropathies, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome or anal entrapment syndrome. And they allow the recognition of subclinical myelopathy. So the spinal cord compression can be elicited by the EMG even before the clinical symptoms appear to the, on the patient. As a differential diagnosis, nerve entrapment syndromes usually differentiated by the EMG. The shoulder girdle disorders, for example, rotator cuff tears, tendinitis, usually the pain will be provoked by the shoulder movement. Acute brachial plexopathy or brachial plexitis, usually viral in origin, uh, this is, can be differentiated by the EMG. Thoracic outlet syndrome, there will be associated vascular symptoms, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis will be a mixture of an upper motor and lower motor neurologian signs, and usually differentiated by the EMG, Bancos tumors, coronary heart disease. Regarding the treatment, what's our aim to treat the patient? First of all, we have to relieve the pain. We have to prevent further neurological deterioration and improve functional limitations. But to reverse or improve neurological deficits, this is the most difficult goal to be attained. Usually, we cannot make this aim. 
What about the non-surgical medication the drugs? We can use variable drugs like analgesia and anesthesial, muscle relaxant, and even psychotropic drugs like antidepressants. The cervical collar actually it have not been approved, has not been approved in the acute to be of benefit in the acute neck pain. The manipulative therapy, العلاج الطبيعي, especially the traction, have been approved to have a short-term relief of radiculopathies. What about the surgery? Surgery will be indicated if we have progressive important motor deficit, whether this deficit is due to nerve root deficit or spinal cord lesion. If the pain persists for more than six weeks despite medical treatment, or we have progressive myelopathy despite non-operative care, or there is a progressive kyphosis but with a neurological deficit. Remember and always say to the patient that the goal of our surgery is to arrest the progression, not to improve the neurological deficit because most of the time the neurological deficit will be irreversible. For the surgical treatment, we have two types. Either we have anterior approach or posterior approach depending on the site of the pathology. The anterior approach, we use it when we have anterior pathology like cervical disc or predominant anterior compression, for example, collapsed vertebrae or osteophytes. Or you, when you have myelopathy with kyphosis, kyphosis is one of the absolute contraindications uh, for posterior approach. Remember this very well. We have two types of surgery, either anterior cervical discectomy with diffusion, and this is remain the gold standard in cervical spondylotic radiculopathies, or we have cervical corpectomy with diffusion. Corpectomy means removal of the whole vertebral body. In this example, for the anterior pathologies, usually the patient will be managed in supine position. We use the CR for localizing. We localize the lesion using the CR to detect the actual space that we want to go through it. Then we open the skin. Later, we open the platysma muscle and do dissection between the strap muscles of the neck. Try to separate the carotid fascia from the pretracheal fascia by blunt dissection. Later, we will reach to the spine and the involved disc space. We put a CSF needle and take an X-ray to make sure that we are in the proper disc space level. Then we put something called distractor, and this distractor will pull away the adjacent vertebrae, so it will increase the space of the disc to facilitate our work on it. We use magnification, either microscope or surgical loop, to remove our aim is to remove the whole disc and remove the hypertrophied high oncovertebral joint that is compressing the nerve root. And actually, this cannot be reached without proper magnification. After we remove the disc, we have to replace it. We have something called cage. And these cages are made of certain plastic material called PEEK, P-E-E-K, reinforced with three pins of titanium, this to make it visible through the X-rays. This is one of our cases where we replaced two discs by two PEEKs. In corpectomy, the same approach, but we use either electrical drills or punches to remove the vertebrae with the adjacent disc space and replace it with either autobonograft, usually taken from the iliac crest, or we have now synthetic vertebral body and reinforce it with a plate and screws to be put in on the adjacent vertebrae. We use it when we have a pathology in the vertebra itself.
In the posterior cervical approach, it is indicated when we have a posterior pathology. For example, if we have a posterior neuronal compression like hypertrophied ligand and flema, if there is multi-level cervical myelopathy, for example, we have multiple discs, for example, four and more, it will not be practical to manage it from anterior approach. Cervical myelopathy, but with the preserved cervical lordosis, as we mentioned, kyphosis is contraindicated. We have here either laminectomies, removal of the lamina, foraminectomies as part of minimally invasive spine surgery or laminoplasty. Here the patient will be managed in a prone position and the head will be fixed with the skull clamps. We do usually midline skin incision and separate the uh, adjacent muscles from the spine. In laminectomy, we remove the laminae and the spinous processes and their associated ligaments to decompress the fecal sac and to decompress uh, the exit points of the nerve roots. If the pathology is only radiculopathy, we can manage it posteriorly with minimally invasive surgery by putting what we call a tube dilator, opening only the area of the facet and remove the facet with the capsule and the adjacent ligand flavum to decompress the nerve root only. Laminoplasty is indicated for only spinal stenosis, usually in young patient where we want to reserve the bony elements rather than removing it completely. So we open, make a partial opening, hemilaminectomy, and keep everything and diffuse it, and decrease the diameter of the spinal canal by putting, for example, an autobonograft or fix with the plates. Regarding the postoperative complications, there are many. Please, this percentage are not required from you just to, to see it only. CSF leak if you injure the dura, recurrent laryngeal nerve if you hit it in anterior approach, dysphagia, horner also by anterior approach, cervical nerve root injury by both anterior and posterior approach, hematoma, tetraparesis if you injure the spinal cord itself, mortality have been mentioned, Local infection, esophageal perforation is very important and dangerous. Non-union or graft dislodgement and collapse depend on what you have use of instruments at your surgery. This is one of our examples, C5-6 disc prolapse with ischemic changes affecting the nerve, the spinal cord itself. Here is the compression. An axial view. The patient managed in prone position. We use the uh, scissor to make a localization of our level. We open transverse. We cut here the omohyoid muscle. Then we put our dilators. We put a CSF needle in order to be sure that we are in C5-6 level. Then we use the microscope and try to remove the disc in piecemeal. Then we put something called the trial to measure the size of the gap that we created after we remove the vertebrae. And we put the peak here. This type of peak have certain screws to reinforce it in its position for the above and below, and the end result is this. And thank you very much.